My name is Hanna Wróbleska and I am director of the Henta National Gallery of Art and commissioner of the Polish Pavilion in Venice. As we all know, okay, opening, nice. <laughs> as we all know, the opening of 17 international architecture exhibition was postponed from May to next year in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic. But we, it means Polish Pavilion, uh, have decided to organize a series of online meetings and panels accompanying to this postponed event. The first panel is conceived and organized by Polish architectural magazine Architectura Murato and is entitled What is the purpose of the exhibitions of architecture, developments of architecture and critical thought? So I would like to thank all our outstanding guests who accepted our invitations and are taking part in this debate. So, Aaron Betsky, curator, critic, rector of School of Architecture at Karizim, David Basulto, editor in chief and founder of Art Daily, the world's leading architectural online platform, Ole Bauman, curator, publicist, critic, currently director of design so society Shenzhen in China, and Julia Kauster, historian and curator of architecture, former longtime director of Museum of Finnish Architecture. And of course, Eva Poremska, Editor-in-Chief of Architectura Murator magazine, and Martin Szczelina, Architecture Critic and Curator, who will conduct these panels. With both of them, we discuss, negotiate, and cooperate since many, many years on various platforms. So, Eva, the floor of the Zoom is yours once more. Thank you. Thank you, Hanna, very much, and especially for giving me the opportunity to co-organize this inspiring meeting. I am very happy that such creative personalities accepted the invitation. And thank you all for coming to our common virtual room. I would like to start with the short introduction regarding the different aspects and goals of an international biennial to the questions focused on its future. Let's start at the very beginning. The first exhibition of architecture at the Venice Biennial in 1980 with Paolo Portoghese's famous exhibition, The Presence of the Past, set a high standard for subsequent architectural events. This was the official beginning of the postmodernist era Thanks to the symbolic Strada Novissima, composed of works by such architects as Frank Gehry, Arata Isozaki, or Robert Venturi. Each subsequent biennial meant great names, great expectations, and also great emotions and ambitions. The diversity, intensity, especially during the pre-opening media base, give us energy and knowledge, which with time grows and verifies our opinions. Let us recall the 1996 biennial Sensing the Future, the architect as a seismograph. We remember that the golden lion in that year went to Japan's pavilion, curated by Kyutoyo Ito, and his team devoted to a project for tsunami victims. Particular hype, however, was focused on an American pavilion showing Walt Disney's giant realization. According to Thomas Krenz, the curator of the exhibition, architecture for Disney was a unique combination of hype and mass culture. Famous names, that took money from Mickey Mouse. It's how the editor of British the Architects Journal wrote about the great Nobel Isozaki. This somewhat schizophrenic condition of the architectural profession, which on the one hand values activism and help for ordinary people, and on the other, the business ability to make huge money in not always democratic parts of the world, is ever more clear in each following biennial. Moreover, years after the architect's seismograph exhibition, 
We appreciate the fact that uh, apart from a great and recognized celebrities such as Renzo Piano, Norman Foster, or Arata Hisozaki, the biennial director, Hans Hollein, invited emerging stars such as Kazuro Sejima, who 13 years later became the curator of the not very successful edition People Meet in Architecture. It's one of the most important La Biennale di Venezia Rose, I mean the promotion of talented architects. With passing years, the formula of the biennial kept changing, just as the world itself was changing. The thing that seemed to remain unquestioned was the existence and scale of the biennial, also its principles based on presentations in national pavilions built years ago and promoting the Eurocentric policy and policy of great powers has been over and over challenged. The pandemic is, however, responsible for the fundamental question of the sense and the future of the Biennale. And here we reach the essence of today's meeting. Recently in the social media at Arc Daily, Ole Bauman, one of our guests, wrote crucial words. Let them be the starting point of our discussion and let me quote. Even before, before the Biennale would uh, have begun, we are being forced to just a new way of living together. To paraphrase the topics of the last 10 years of Biennale, today's condition presents us with a new common ground for architecture, David Chipperfield. Such format would be really be about reporting from the front, Alejandro Aravena. Now it's time not to just rethink, but remake our fundamentals, premkulas, and to allow everyone to participate and show generosity to all who can, Farrell and McNamara. Climate, biodiversity, human tracking, social distancing, the new spatial contract is now. Architecture, please. Uh, all in all, I get inspired by this article. So let's start with Ole Bauman. Ole, you know La Biennale di Venezia perfectly well. However, you have also an experience as the creative director of Urbanism Architecture Biennale in Shenzhen, Hong Kong. In comparison, in what direction, in your personal opinion, should La Biennale di Venezia go? Uh, yeah, Eva, thank you very much for, for referring to that article, uh, which I published uh, at Art Daily uh, uh, just two weeks before the, the lockdown happens in, in Europe. Uh, and indeed, I thought uh, uh, since the um, epidemic, the pandemic is uh, 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 such a pressing issue today, uh, when it comes to organizing one of the most important uh, institutional events in the world in the field of architecture. Uh, it's almost like inevitable to assess the impact of such a pandemic on, on the statute of the discipline, on the, on the status of, of, of architecture. So uh, I, I wrote this article actually as a kind of um, anticipation of, a, of, a, of an alternative decision uh, to, to do something vis-a-vis -vis that, that situation. Um, uh, and actually to bring to get, let's say, to, to bridge the gap that uh, I felt already for many years uh, in Venice between, uh, between the urgency of the themes that, that were brought up by the uh, chief curators on the one hand, and on the other hand, the, um, let's say, the, the repetitive format, and I might also say uh, a kind of leisurely background of the debate on these urgent issues. So the tension between format and urgency was already on the table for a long time. Now uh, the current situation may actually help us to, to bridge that gap and, and 
and do something that expresses this urgency much more directly than by simply postponing uh, such an event once again. And actually they postponed again now to 2021. So, so I think, I think the um, uh, opportunity that could have been taken but hasn't been taken yet is to, um, uh, to act upon the urgencies and in particularly the urgent issue that was posed by the present chief curator, uh, Hashim Starkis, uh, which is about how we are going to live together. Uh, which uh, is immediately affected by what we are going through these days. Uh, even the, the, disc the discussion that politicians and, 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 and uh, people from the medic uh, specialisms, the outbreak teams in, in many countries, they are using spatial categories all the time. And the most debated spatial category that, that we are uh, using today is uh, social distancing. Um, distance, in a way, is an architectural concept. It could be, at least. You know, it's not necessarily so, but it could be. And uh, I was trying to advocate a position, not only for the institution, but of course also for many architects, mm -hmm. to adopt this uh, spatial dimension of our current uh, predicament and to, uh, to act upon it. Uh, on the one hand, by not postponing, but by jumping into this situation right away and, uh, and, and play a role as, as Biennale in the current uh, uh, rapid, rapidly developing uh, discourse on social distancing. Uh, but certainly also to inspire uh, the many architects that are now uh, in front of that basic questions uh, they're all facing. Are they, a part of, are they part of the solution or are they just sensing the problem? Uh, I won't say they are part of the problem, but they, they, many of them, they, they just are part of, of the situation without yet um, jumping in and coming up with an architectural thinking that may be helpful in the way we reorganize our lives uh, and in the current situation. So that was, that was the, uh, the background of the article and I think uh, in, in that sense it's still uh, uh, very relevant. And um, uh, as you were mentioning the, uh, the quotes at the end of the article referring to the five Biennale installments before where every time uh, the chief curator posed a very important, urgent issue. Um, I think this was also an opportunity, and it still is, to uh, reinstate the relevance of the institution beyond words, right? and to, to reformat it in such a way that it becomes more like a relevant uh, agent in the way we deal with these problems, rather than only the, the, the location where things can be presented and being discussed by uh, our peers. So uh, that, is, that is, I think, uh, why this article had to be written. And uh, thank you for adopting it as, uh, as a starting point. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Aaron, do you agree with Ole? Drawing on your experience uh, as a director of the 11th exhibition of La Biennale di Venezia, out there, architecture beyond building, do you think that the Biennale should be modified? How much it depends on the organizers and how much on the curators, their individual visions? Um, well, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, by the way, I think I took a little bit of offense when you denigrated Sejima's Biennale, which I think was probably the most successful Biennale of the modern age, uh, maybe even better than mine. Uh, so I, I think we should be a little bit careful about that. Um, I think the question that both you and Ola raise are good ones uh, because, of course, you're right, the curator sets a theme and they then try to uh, elucidate what they mean by that theme um, in the exhibitions over which they have control. Um, and then already the people who participate in that do what they think is best, so you have only limited control about that. But then of course that's only a small part of the Biennale because then there's all the country pavilions. And we should also remember that uh, like in many other such events, uh, art fairs and other Biennales, it is actually the other events that are now happening all around Venice that have become just as important, including 
of course, a growing number that happen online. Having said that, so the answer is you only have a very limited uh, possibility. And it's more one of tone, I think, than of content. So when, like David Chipperfield, you concentrate on showing big, big old-fashioned buildings by your friends, uh, then you get an exhibition of photographs of monuments and it becomes, in my mind, boring. When you try to raise topics, um, you at least have the chance that people will bring them up. Um, sometimes you can either ver even very aggressively bring them into your own exhibitions, as for instance, Rem Kohlhaas did in his. Sometimes you can evoke them, as I believe Sejima did. So you have to use various strategies. And I think it's a question of how to use strategies that becomes more and more important. To, to be specific, uh, continuing on Ola's uh, very trenchant criticism, I think there's one basic aspect of the Biennale that everyone agrees needs to be completely rethought, but has to face the realities of the constraints on that. And that is the country pavilion model, which is how the Biennale started. By now, of course, the exhibitions in those pavilions have very little to do with those countries. Uh, and uh, if you think, for instance, about the excellent uh, Polish contributions uh, in the last few years, they have brought up much more general and very important issues. Well, uh, Polish curators like Marcin himself have contributed with important issues like reuse in the main Biennale. So, this notion that uh, you need to have country pavilions is on the face of it now absurd. And yes, it is very, very Eurocentric, it's based on colonial powers. So we need to get rid of it. The problem is that it is those countries that pay for much of this. So I think uh, what is needed is also an exploration of new funding models. I have long believed that the Biennale is very well positioned to be more than just the organizer of an occasional event, because also remember, it's not just an art binala and architecture binala, it's also a film festival, a theater festival, a dance festival. And in so doing, it brings together a lot of incredible thinking uh, that every time, of course, fails to make the biennale that they think they're going to make or the festival they're going to make. I think that's in, built into the nature of it. But in so doing so, it's a glorious failure because it brings incredible debate and discussion. And in many ways, I think the criticism that is brought to bear on the Biennale is, is more important than what the Biennale itself shows because it gives you something to talk about. And that is above all else its function. It brings people together. And I do think the physical bringing together is extremely important. Um, and, and I'm very dubious about this idea that it's okay and everything will now be virtual. No, you need to really find a way to bring people together, give, invest enough money that you have a series of very concrete ideas, topics exhibited, and this for me again is very important, that they're actually there that you can look at because talking and writing, you lose interest, et cetera. You need focal point, you need fetish objects, you need a kind of place of gathering and then that discussion is really what is more in, in important and it goes on for years before and after. So, sorry, that's a very long way of saying what, what I believe the Biennale really should think about is really being a research and development institute uh, housed in Venice that would really see this, the discussion of these kind of issues on a permanent basis uh, producing not only the exhibition, but also discussion papers and virtual conferences and all the things that I, I agree with Ola should be going on all the time, continually. I think that Venice could be the kind of um, uh, UN of architecture, if you will. Um, and I, I think it has all the possibilities, uh, like uh, Elizabeth Warren in America would say, I have a plan for that, but who's going to pay for it, so that's the next question. One just last point. I think we have to be very careful about two points. We all are getting seduced right now into making predictions, and, and I have gotten seduced uh, kicking and screaming, but seduced nonetheless. I think we have to be very 
careful about thinking that we know what the world is going to be like. Talking about it, speculating about it is great, but again, we need to have a focal point, not just talking endlessly like we're doing, you know, which is why it's good we're talking about the Venice Biennale. We need to have very specific things to talk about. The second, and this is something I disagree with uh, Ola on, we have to disagree about something, uh, is the notion of solutions. I don't think that architecture can provide solutions. Architecture can provide speculations, architecture can uh, engage in experiments, it can create scenarios, it can do even proof of concepts, which I believe of what exhibitions are, but it will not solve problems. Um, and I think that the best thing architects should be doing right now is indeed thinking about both uh, space material and form, the basic building blocks of architecture, uh, and thinking about what knowledge it can be towards a future, towards a future producing, producing Something happened with the voice? Hello? I just finished and... Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, Julia, uh, speaking about uh, strategies, you were the curator of Finnish Pavilion in 2016 with Ole Bauman, as we know. The equation reflected on the notion of authentic and replica. Such dilemma, however, is crucial in the border cultural context. Mm -hmm. uh, what does the Biennale mean to you? And turning my fundamental question, in which direction, in your opinion, should La Biennale di Venezia go, Julio? Yes, uh, very, uh, very interesting angle to try to enter it. Um, first, I would address a little bit of uh, what Aaron Betsky was saying about the national pavilions. And of course, yes, in a way, uh, national pavilions represent an old fashioned idea that is very Eurocentric and that presents this kind of idea that a country has to use uh, the Biennale as a showcase for what's going on in the country. But I would take a different approach to this idea of the existence of the national presentations and think of it more like, okay, Venice is a place where lots of different angles from different parts of the world can be brought together and can be brought into dialogue uh, with each other. Uh, and uh, the Nordic perspective is undoubtedly uh, looking at even what's going on today differently from, for example, an Asian perspective. Uh, just because our tradition, our culture, our system uh, is different. So we bring a different angle into a commonly shared subject. And so in that sense, I feel like uh, the idea of some kind of uh, way of making sure that there are different angles from different parts of the world, that is not only the responsibility of the main curatorial task but is also somehow otherwise represented in the Biennale should actually be uh, rather uh, elaborated on uh, and taken advantage of more than uh, something that is totally outdated and, and should no longer exist. Uh, and then uh, in terms of um, the collaboration that we did with Ole, uh, for me, that was, we, we did a work that was presented first in Jenzan in the context of the Biennale there, and then brought in a different iteration to Venice. And the whole idea of that whole installation was first of all, to use the exhibition as a place where you can experiment and reflect on specific issues that emerge out of that uh, context. And in that we brought to, uh, we were looking at authenticity and the idea of the Nordic way of understanding authenticity. And then 
what the heck happens when the Nordics go into China and start imposing their own way of thinking and asking for Chinese people to start collaborating and to create something. And the first thing that we enter into is that we fully look very different uh, upon what authenticity even is and why would it be important. Uh, and, and then out of that emerged uh, that installation that we presented then in, in both of those places, but we, it was very specifically created in the context of Shenzhen and in China. Uh, and, and I think that is an example of what I mean by the idea that the Biennale should be used rather uh, as a place where different kinds of perspectives actually can be brought into dialogue with each other. And then I very much agree with what Ole was saying that this current situation with the pandemic is really, uh, we could look at it as an opportunity to actually finally take action and, and do something differently from what we have done before. And I feel that uh, the pandemic, it's influencing all of us, but it's influencing all of us in different ways. And we choose the ways in which we react to it. Uh, and we can react by saying, yes, we want everything to be the same after this is over and we'll just wait until it is over. Or we can take it as an invitation to act and do something at this moment differently. And I am very, very much looking forward to seeing what the individual national pavilion curators are able to uh, do within this year. Now they got a year to reflect on how they want to maybe reshape their original idea of uh, touching uh, the curatorial theme of how we live together. Uh, and it really remains to be seen if they are capable of thinking of something that is actually addressing the current situation in a better way, or are they just simply taking this as like, okay, we got a little bit more time to fine tune the work uh, in the way that we originally intended to present it. Thank you. Uh, we all know that uh, Biennale is international context. David, you are the founder of the world's most visited architecture website, Art Daily. So it means that you recognize the signs of the future and that you are one of uh, the compass setting new trends, isn't it? So in what direction, in your personal opinion, should Lebanon and Venezia go? Uh... Yeah, very good question is this future, a future that we're all looking for answers today. And the fact that we're having this discussion is because we recognize on the Venice Biennale um, that power, that power to deliver questions, to speculate, uh, to act fast. We require, we ask that from, from the Biennale. And as you paint in your uh, review of past Biennales, it ranges from the archives to the effects of buildings, and now we're seeing more and more questions, questions uh, with an open end, looking towards a future. And today, this uh, need for a more than international gathering, a global gathering to address global problems, planetary problems, is much needed than ever. And I think that the, when we talk about the organizers, the curators, we recognize that the Biennale has this, this capacity of gathering. It will attract everybody who wants to contribute, even the unwanted contributions will come. It's like, it's like this Batman signal. So how can the Biennale take on this responsibility? They have the possibility to make this congregation, and now under this very strong question, how we will live? That is being questioned by the pandemics, but not only because of that, all the social uh, unrest that has been happening around the world, political, uh, the changing political context. All these questions accelerate, accelerate, but I think that the most important is that they are going beyond architecture. Always architecture has been critical of itself that sometimes becomes, becomes a bubble. But now that we are questioning uh, all these issues in an accelerating way, uh, and the world is suffering, 
and it's addressing the suffering to, well, first, the space in, where, in which we are quarantined, the way how our density is maybe posing risks or challenges to this kind of future, or even the, the notion of what the countryside could provide to us. So all these things are becoming very transversal issues, and we see it, especially as we step on technology to be connected. Today, architecture is something that is disconnecting from architects. It is becoming transversal, something that is dominating Netflix, something that is dominating Instagram. And more and more, I think that the, in this inflection point for the Biennale, I think the most important is that it can open a, open architecture beyond architects. Thank you very much. Uh, I know that um, our colleague Marcin Szczelina can't wait to talk with you. So uh, Marcin, now stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. I think that we, I want to focus more about uh, how to prepare a good exhibition if we are able to do that. So my first question is to you, Lia. Eva already mentioned that the last, that the last final uh, you presented the exhibition called um, Another uh, General City, an exhibition that explores the relationship between the nature and the built environment. Uh, in the text, uh, in the curatorial text, you wrote, you wrote that uh, um, this exhibition is an opportunity to rethink the most fundamental relationship between our building and ecology, how is ecology? And I think that this is a very important question related to the, uh, I think that we, each year we are wondering how, how much garbages we are producing in every Biennale and we really don't know what to do that. So do you have a um, um, tip or do you know how we can reduce it or which way we should go to not produce so much waste and garbage every year? And of course, not only in the Biennale, but even otherwise, I think that, you know, that relates to also this question of that this pandemic really kind of offers us an opportunity to either embrace it as a, a call for action to do something differently or kind of just wait and be like, yes, we want to get back to the normal as soon as possible. We want to get back to flying and consuming and going to restaurants and uh, drinking beer and, you know, get the economy running. Uh, whereas, you know, for at least a few months now, it has forced each one of us to really kind of change our everyday routines, to slow down, to focus, to rethink, and to really realize that it is possible to do di things differently. And it's not only possible, but in many cases, it actually has turned out that after the first two weeks of frustration, you're actually seeing that, wow, you know, it's actually but, but wait, good. wait a second. I'm, I'm getting a little tired of this in the media because all the people who are saying this are like us, privileged white people who have the means to engage in this kind of dialogue and the means to get this kind of information and who have the means to make money even virtually. So on that level alone, I think we need to question whether this notion is just some evil force about getting capitalism going again and getting restaurants going, or whether there's a real need to have information and social power spread through means that do not privilege those who already have the powerful means to access. So, I, I realize that we are faced with two different issues. One, there is the carbon waste of all getting to one place. On the other hand, however, there is also this sense that, oh, well, we can just be virtual and everything will be okay. I'm sorry, but we will be talking to ourselves and we will be navel staring. I, but I, I do think that we need this kind uh, for, for power to disperse it also needs to spread out. So I would be completely open to thinking of uh, biennales that have a traveling aspect so that it can go more to the people rather than having people come there. But again, I still think that meeting people from all over the world in one place 
has an importance. And I also, I agree completely with Marcin, we need to do it in a more logical way. It's something that I have been more and more focused on in my work. Uh, I think that Ravena made a good, very good start with his opening gallery uh, at the Venice Biennale he directed with the reuse of the previous exhibition. I think we do need to do much, much more of that and th think much more uh, in a much more smart way. I know at the Biennale, they've already started talking about that, but I think that Marson's point is a very good one, but we should be very focused. We need to figure out, number one, how we can make Biennales that have less waste, that reuse rather than rethink. Second of all, we need to make Biennales more accessible. And third of all, we need to figure out how we can allow this kind of social gathering and social interaction to happen in a way that is, of course, responsible, uh, has less risk, is again open to more people. And those to me are very concrete goals that we should have. Yeah, Getting see. back to Morrison's uh, point about, uh, you know, the exhibition uh, in the Nordic Pavilion 2018. Uh, basically, my point with this was not to say that we wouldn't ever go back to traveling and, and to being busy, but more to say that, okay, let's take from this moment the things that we value and that we have learned and let's make something of them. Uh, so in 2018, the, the kind of initial idea for the uh, exhibition was to embrace the question of how our relationship to nature is changing and how much you know, we have focused on this idea that we need to separate ourselves from nature. And now we are basically trying to figure out different ways of actually uh, respecting nature in a new way and, and taking better care of it. Architecture can do a lot in that, but what can it do and how can it do it? And what possible ways are there uh, in really kind of changing the ways in which we approach it? And so, I would love to see this moment uh, to be an inspiration for taking that question more seriously in the future. So of course we are, we're all talking about how we can recycle our buildings better and how we can use better materials uh, that are more ecologically friendly and, and so on. But it's not only that, it's also very much about how we relate to our cities and how we think about the whole idea of what uh, we can do uh, when we create the architectural shape of our living and, and of our cities. Yeah, I think that it will be great if we start to think about how to reduce among of waste and it will be the good uh, start next uh, year to speak about it and to try to find uh, uh, a new way of communication uh, in the Biennale. But uh, I have a question to David, uh, because uh, Eva, of course, also mentioned uh, that you are uh, the founder of the, one of the biggest uh, architectural platform in the world. And you mentioned about Instagram, that we have this new media that changed totally the, the perspective on architecture. And I also hear being in the Venice that a lot of people said, oh, this exhibition will be, looks like great on Instagram. And uh, I have been somehow that kind of uh, thinking that uh, that impression that the architecture has become somehow uh, somewhat flattened. So uh, using this experience, I'm back to you as a curator in 2016, uh, yes, in the Nordic Pavilion. Did you use this experience in the preparation of your exhibition? It was helpful. Um, well, for, for that exhibition, and, and I, I don't think I saw it that way, but now we... Oh, I think that we lost connection, so... To use the exhibit to, oh, to look... Ah, oh, sorry. Yes, can you repeat? Uh, I think that now I see it in a more conscious way. At that moment, that exhibit, what tried to try to do was to to use the, the Biennale as an instance to look into yourself, even through psychological means, 
it, to make this moment to, to show the Nordic countries, say, what you have done in architecture, how you have shaped society. Be conscious about what you have done. Look into yourself. Now we're in an, in an era that this overconnection put us in, into that aspect. We try to, to develop ourselves in the world, into society with more people, and we start to question uh, who we are, who we are as individuals, who we are as citizens in a city, in an urban environment. And I think that today um, we are becoming much more conscious about this, conscious about what we want to be as individuals, as architects, for example, visiting the Biennale, participating, being curators. And I think that what we tried to do back in 2016 is something that today is very patent. We, all, we also talk about this thing, the Maslow uh, pyramid of hierarchies into even social networks. What do the social networks give to us? They give us belonging, they give us vanity, but they make us advance in a way. So I, I think that this uh, flattening, that is the, the danger of globalization, is also making us be more conscious and to address these kind of things, Marcin. I think that that exit that we did back in 2016, at least for me, the concepts stay very strong until today. Okay, so uh, Aaron, uh, uh, speak a little bit about uh, how to make this exhibition. Uh, in Venice, and I found that kind of interview when you gave, and you said that you don't believe in showing photos, models, or drawings of buildings that were created elsewhere. I don't believe in showing the record of the creation process. In both cases, I am convinced that if you came to the exhibition, you are here because of the presence of objects or spaces worth seeing not to read the text and watch uh, movies. There is much more better place for it. So my question for you is, did you change the perspective? Um, no. <laughs> if not, no, so this, this tell me thing. how to prepare a good exhibition for the Venice, because this is a very unique situation. Oh, well, of course, by now, it's, uh, that's 12 years ago. So technology <laughs> has changed a lot. But no, I, I think it's even more true now. It, it irritates me no end in many, not just biennales, but many exhibitions that you go to a building, uh, you walk in the door, you expect to see something, and instead you find yourself reading what you could be reading on your screen at home or watching on your screen at home. Uh, or you see, as I said, postcards of buildings elsewhere, and you say, well, why didn't I just, you know, get that on my, on my Kindle or did it, you know, or watch it on my screen? Or if I really want to use up trees, why didn't I uh, just buy it as a book? Uh, it will be much more beautiful and I can look at it much more clearly. Again, I think the, the one thing I, I would try to clarify about my past statement is I think that we need to understand uh, architecture exhibitions as places, if they have a role at all, that will be a, um, a condensation or a speculation on architectural issues in a way that is concrete. And I don't mean made out of concrete uh, in the English sense, but that has a presence that you can experience, first of all, there, and second of all, in a social sense. And that for me is the only reason to do that. If you don't do that, then yes, uh, do, a, do a book or do a website or do an Instagram photograph or whatever else you want. We should be clear about the roles of different media. I always, when I used to run a museum, um, I always used to ask curators or people who came up with exhibitions idea, is that really an idea for an exhibition? Is an idea for a paper, a research paper, is an idea for a book, is an idea for a conference, is an idea for a website, is an idea for, there are many, many ven venues. So again, we have to be very specific about what uh, Venice can offer or what any venue for architecture exhibitions can offer and uh, what it cannot offer. We have to be very specific about that. Yeah, so Ola, uh, as uh, Adam said, uh, Architecture exhibition is on, uh, it speak on, uh, it's on about representation of architecture because we can put 
for example, the building to the to the exhibiting space. So um, I, I'm not sure if each of you write that kind of book, but I think that there is only one. Uh, it's called Architecture on Display on the History of the Venice Architecture of Vienna. And uh, the authors, the authors of the book, Aaron Levy and William Menkings, uh, talked to, to all the living curators of the uh, Venice by now. And um, this is amazing that each of them said that exhibiting architecture is impossible. Do you agree with it that this is almost uh, um, impossible to prepare exhibition, good exhibition about architecture and present architecture in, the, uh, in that context of the Venice Biennale, of the gallery space, or in a totally different context? Maybe if you insist on the use of the word exhibition to exhibit architecture, maybe then you run into that problem. Uh, but uh, there are other verbs that you can use to, to display or to play out or to enact uh, architecture in a cultural event. So I, th I think that's already, that's, that's already on the linguistic level something to consider. We are so used to think in terms of exhibitions that we immediately think about exhibiting. And that has a certain connotation that uh, makes it quite passive. Um, I, think, I think it's true. Uh, 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 architecture always has this problem of um, a certain abstraction that you cannot be inside the architecture, but actually you see a representation of it. And uh, I think um, uh, uh, most architecture events, exhibitions, are raising an issue rather than demonstrating the, uh, the, the, the let's say the, the, the inner the, the inner depth of that issue right away. So there's a there is an eternal abstraction that uh, uh, can make an architectural event still very worthwhile for peers, but for most other people, it's not. And then if you think about uh, the uh, format of Venice, uh, that's another frame that uh, may be extremely interesting for peers, but not so much for others, uh, because uh, it's, it's another abstraction in, in a way, uh, away from the um, original situation or the immediate uh, experience. Uh, so I, I think that, that that is an issue that we definitely have, have to address, especially since architecture uh, as, it's, uh, as such is about, is not, is certainly not, first of all, about speculation. It's about fact-making. So architects are strong as uh, speculative minds, but they hopefully they are even stronger in creating facts on the ground. And uh, there's, it's such, so strange that uh, when it comes to architecture exhibition, this, this capacity of architects to create a fact on the ground seems to be forgotten. Uh, and that may, may also refer to uh, uh, what Ewa was uh, saying in the introduction about um, the difference between Biennales. Uh, now I'm talking about Venice Biennale, but I worked before for the uh, uh, Shenzhen Biennale. Actually, uh, Aaron did as well as, as chief curator. And uh, the great thing of the Shenzhen Biennale is that uh, the Biennale is uh, immediately seen as something that should have an immediate impact on city making. Uh, actually, it is an act of city making. So rather than an abstraction, it is, it is uh, uh, concrete per se. It is, it is intrinsically uh, the idea of the whole Biennale to, to be an intervention in real urban life. Uh, and that could be an also an interesting angle to consider uh, how you can innovate the very uh, idea of Biennales and architecture exhibitions to see them as potential interventions in real life. And once that happens, uh, you have a completely different, uh, uh, different answer to your initial question about waste, right? Because once uh, architecture, an architecture event is at the same time a speculation uh, at once and, and, and a intervention in real life, uh, the question of waste uh, turns around and uh, has, has not that kind of bad neck, uh, connotation that it may have when you, when you think about, uh, let's say, the, uh, the relics of uh, such a huge event as in Venice. Uh, 
Yeah. Each of you mentioned that pandemic completely changed the approach to the world. We live in a completely different time. And uh, we have been saying for some time that we cannot go to the path of continuous growth. Jeremy Rifkin, in the book uh, he wrote three years ago, The Zero Marginal Cost Society, already announced that we are at the beginning of the end of capitalism. Well, I'm not sure if, if there will be uh, the end of the capitalism, but for sure we are aware that something coming up. We didn't know that it will be pandemic. So the question for you, do you think that exhibitions and that kind of biennials um, is a still a good medium to speak about architecture? Or maybe we should try to find a new medium to speak about it. Aaron? I didn't realize that was addressed to me. Could you repeat that last <laughs> I, part? This is, like, this is just a question to each of you based okay. on your experience. So um, I just, I really wondering if this still that the exhibition is still a good medium to speak about architecture. I, I, I well, I, I think it is, but of course, like every medium, it is changing. So I agree with Ola that uh, finding a way to make exhibitions less passive is very important. I, I disagree with him in that I think that they can be very uh, provocative and engaging if they leave, lead, uh, reach the level of this kind of immersion or immediacy that some of the best uh, installations have done. Um, and that to me is where the, the future lies, uh, as well as interestingly enough, uh, the polar opposite of that, which is that I believe that museums, uh, and in this place I may be very ridiculously conservative, uh, I think that museums have preserved, uh, even well before this coronavirus, uh, exactly this uh, moment of reflection, reflection and pause and limbo about which Julia was speaking, and that finding a way to make exhibitions that are actually in contrast to what Ola was calling for, which I also think has, has great value, but have this quality of remove, have this quality of silence, uh, have this quality of disconnection is equally important. How you do that without having them be elitist is something that I've struggled with running museums when I ran museums for 15 years. Um, and I never quite found a solution to it, worked on it very hard. I, I think there are avenues worth pursuing, but, but that to me is important. So I would argue that we need both and. We need uh, Ola's model of the city building through exhibition, which is something Colin Rowe uh, spoke about in a very eloquent way in Collage City, um, working, talking about it the other way around. But we also need this notion of exhibition as this moment of pause, reflection, immersion, removal, limbo that causes a break uh, within the hectic space of everyday life that uh, many of us indeed have come to value as the silver lining in the coronavirus um, pandemic. Okay, uh, so uh, um, when we speak about the future, it's, it's all the time about kind of speculation. We don't know what, what would happen. But do you think that the next uh, Biennale, which is postponed Biennale, should be strongly related to the pandemic? No, uh, or it should be related to the new reality. This is question also. New realities are unfolding now, so of course the Biennale needs to address those. But I think we have to be again very careful to think that we have answers and know exactly what the contours of are. It's changing by the week. Um, I was just looking at a very very good piece by Alice Walker in Curb, where she was already talking about how once again uh, all of the almost dead white male. Uh, urban theorists, including probably some of us here, uh, have made pronouncement about how this confirms necessity for dense cities, uh, whereas in fact, more and more data is saying that it is only exasperating the injustice and social disparities that are baked into the current way that we have dense cities. And when you make them denser and make urban walking streets and all these kind of lovely things, you're only creating more injustice. So. 
let's be careful. I'm not saying let's be conservative, but let's be careful. Let's commit to thinking about this, speculating about it, but let's not think that we have the solution and let's not think that the, this particular virus, which will sooner or later pass only to be replaced by other crises, is what we should focus on. We should not focus on this crisis. We should focus on the basic sustainability issue, the fact that we will not be around as human beings 50 years from now, even if the cockroaches will be. We should focus on social injustice and economic injustice, which this crisis has only exasperated to a great extent. Those are the kind of issues that we should be focused on, not on this particular, can we make more sanitary surfaces for office workers to press to, to work in. Yeah, I, I think this is, I, th I think this is uh, really an important uh, issue because uh, in the examples that uh, Aaron comes up with, uh, actually he they are all about uh, uh, um, going beyond architecture as in uh, as a kind of um, structural discipline. Uh, it's about a social discipline. It's about social innovation. And uh, also David uh, spoke about this. And and if you ask the question, uh, will uh, will architecture exhibitions still uh, uh, be good to talk about architecture. Yes, of course, but uh, uh, it depends on what you want to talk about. And uh, if, if um, we are able to talk about these questions beyond <clears throat> this, the, uh, the direct uh, production of buildings, uh, but we talk about the, the uh, impact that we are making by, by designing architecture, that is the key thing. And uh, that sounds like a very uh, uh, commonplace, but on the other side, uh, I think uh, still in architectural discourse, there is a reluctance to do so. Uh, even now in, in, the, in, the current, in the current urgency that we uh, feel in our uh, daily lives, uh, in the professional discourse, there is still reluctance to embrace it as an architectural challenge. And, um, we have witnessed that before already for two decades when it came to the environmental issue or the sustainability issue. Uh, there, the, the fact that architecture is um, uh, not onto it, uh, but actually uh, still lagging behind the urgency that some politicians and um, environmentalists are expressing is something that we should reckon with. And, and, and hopefully architecture can catch up with this urgency and be open to these kind of beyond questions because without architecture will have a harder and harder time as a profession to survive. So it's six o'clock, I, 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 I'm sorry to say. <laughs> I agree yes. completely. Um, uh, I, I'm afraid that I have to leave because I have another meeting, but please, is, it's a great yes, discussion. This I is what I want to say, that it's six o'clock and uh, I would like to have a, a very short uh, summary of our discussion. But, uh, but we can understand that uh, Aaron uh, must leave us. So thank you very much, Aaron. See you next time. So. Bye, Aaron. Um, so thank you very much, Martin. I would like to thank our guests and try to conclude, but it is not very uh, easy. So, uh, David insists that the very important is to talk, um, to look for individual experience. Julia, how important is respecting nature? Aaron indicated that architecture cannot provide the solutions, but in contrary, Ole um, says that architects are strong in creating facts. So, on the one hand, the biennial need changes, but on the other, we notice that the new forms are not obvious and we need to discuss uh, in the coming months. And I think that we all agree that uh, the pandemic has made us realize that the world can function in a quite different way. We have been talking about climate changes, more water resources, carbon footprint for a long time. And suddenly it turns out that we can limit our travel 
restrict car traffic in cities, reduce consumption. It was enough to stop tourist travel for jellyfish to appear in Venice canals. It also turns out that we successfully meet online, even organize international conferences like this one. In this way, uh, costs are much lower. Do you remember the amounts of paper wasted at La Biennale di Venezia years ago? All those gifts, gadgets, and shiny bags that landed in hotel dumpsters as soon as journalists return to their rooms? I'm not saying that this situation, economic freeze, can last forever, but it is a good moment to rethink the world. Rethink also the organization of the Biennale, but I would like to stress that its virtual only form is hard to accept. Because, as Ole Bauman wrote two years ago in the volume magazine, Venice is priceless. And let me quote once more. Venice has a charm that outperforms any curator's statement, any Biennale theme, any golden lion, and even the exhibition. And that's why every two years, the global professional community gathers again. Beautiful words, beautiful Venice, and I hope that we will meet there again. Thank you all for your time and attention, and see you in Venice next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.